Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Defense Systems Information Analysis Center, or DSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. DSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the defense systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the defense systems domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Defense Systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD Defense Systems research. Well, hello, uh, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're joining us from. Appreciate you dialing in to uh, this month's webinar. Um, my name is Brian Benish with DSIAC. Hope you enjoyed our little intro video there. Um, if you want more information about our organization, you can just, I would encourage you just to go to our website, dsiac, dsiac.org. Um, you can poke around, see what you can find there, and we'd be happy to, to answer any other questions you might have about what we can do for you. Um, so just a couple quick logistics about the webinar presentation before we begin. For those who are joined um, in the, uh, who are dialed in only and are just going to be following along with the audio, you can download the slides um, so you can have them open and follow along along with the audio. The slides are available um, on our website on this webinar's webpage. So if you navigate it to our website under resources, webinars, and then find this one, you'll be you'll find a link uh, where you can directly download the PDF slides for this webinar and follow along that way. Um, if you do have any technical difficulties throughout this webinar presentation, rest assured it's being recorded and we'll send out a link to where you can access that after uh, probably tomorrow at some point. Um, for those who are joined in the online platform, uh, just a couple things I want to point you to. Uh, first of all, if at any point during the presentation you have a question that you'd like to ask Dr. Boyd, um, I'd encourage you to submit that through the audience questions uh, button icon that should be at the top middle of your screen. Uh, you, you should be able to click that. It looks like a little di uh, chat icon. Um, you can click add a new question, type in your question, and we will um, answer those at the Q&A portion at the end of the presentation. But again, file them in at any point during the presentation. I, I do want to distinguish that from the chat feature. There's an, a, a chat feature that will be on your left hand side of the screen um, that will, will go to us. Uh, we'll monitor that to make sure that no questions accidentally get dropped into the chat. Um, but again, it, I just want to make sure that if you do have a question, you try to put it through the question portal to the button at the top middle of your screen. Um, and I think that covers kind of the basic logistics. Um, and so without further ado, um, I'm going to hand the rest of the time over to Dr. Boyd uh, for his presentation introduction, and he can take it from there. So Dr. Boyd, the floor is yours. Uh, great, Brian. Thanks for um, inviting me uh, today to, to talk to the group. Um, so the, the title of my talk here is Interdisciplinary Hypersonics Research in Academia. Um, I'm a professor of aerospace engineering sciences here at the University of Colorado in uh, beautiful Boulder. Um, I'm also the director for our Center for National Security Initiatives. Um, so let's begin with an outline of what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to start by um, reviewing the status of uh, university hypersonics research uh, in the U.S. and uh, compare that with China. And through that comparison, you'll see uh, some new directions to emerge. And one of the important directions, one of the important new directions is this idea of interdisciplinary research. And so that's the main theme of uh, the talk for today, interdisciplinary research. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why it's so difficult in the hypersonics field. 
I'm going to talk about um, the components that go into interdisciplinary, right? The word interdisciplinary means, you know, across or among different disciplines. And so I'll show you some examples from some of our work here to sort of illustrate uh, the main points I'm trying to make, the, the technical challenges that we face um, in, with some examples from thermal management and also uh, vehicle shape optimization. And then uh, end with a summary. So um, obviously, there's, uh, we're well aware that there's been a lot of um, effort, a sustained effort in China in hypersonic, uh, you know, maybe for the last 15 years or so. Um, and that includes universities. Right? So, the, so China has taken uh, several steps to, to bolster its hypersonics academic community. You know, one good example of infrastructure, they've built a lot of new uh, wind tunnels in their universities over the last 15 years. Um, they're funding a lot of students uh, and postdocs and scientists at the universities to study and research uh, in China, uh, but also at U.S. universities. I mean, these numbers I'm showing here are from a few years ago, but I still think that's, a, that's an amazing number. 140,000 students from China studying in STEM fields at U.S. universities in, in that particular year. Certainly smaller uh, because of COVID and other things today, but, but nevertheless, you know, I, as a university professor, I routinely get emails from Chinese nationals saying that they have, you know, full ride fellowships from their government, and can they please come and, you know, work on hypersonics in, in my lab here in the U.S. One of the things I've seen in the decades I've worked in universities here in the U.S. Uh, on hypersonics is is the opportunities that Chinese nationals uh, have. You know, ten years ago, years ago. Um, a student from China coming to work in an American university on hypersonics uh, would almost always stay in the U.S. after they completed their degree uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but now they certainly have viable options to go and work in hypersonics back in their homeland, and, and many of them do. And so that's something that's definitely changed, you know, in, in just the, in the last couple of decades. Um, Another thing that China has done prominently uh, to, to show their, their progress in hypersonics is they hosted um, 2017 International Hypersonics Conference that is organized by the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Um, a couple of years ago, I spent a sabbatical leave a year in uh, Washington, D.C., at um, the Science and Technology Policy Institute that's run by um, the Institute for Defense Analyses. And um, one of the, the activities I was involved in there, a study I, I, I led there, uh, compared, made a quanti quantitative comparison uh, between the U.S. and China uh, in terms of their university work on hypersonics. And this, uh, this result here is taken from that uh, report, and it's from 2017, but it's, it's still valid what the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, this shows the, the distribution of topics that Chinese authors uh, published uh, on hypersonics in international journals. So th this is not the Chinese journal of hypersonics. These are the international journals that everybody in the West uh, would want to publish in. And, you know, so they can see that they're, they're publishing papers on, on air thermodynamics, uh, guidance, navigation, control, propulsion materials. It's not a perfect distribution across these different areas, but it's a spread. Okay, and we're, we're going to see how that compares to uh, what the U.S. was doing at the same time. So again, thinking back to 2017, uh, what was the state of university hypersonics uh, in the U.S.? Uh, the total federal funding was about 20 million per year. So that's coming from uh, DOD and from NASA and a little bit from uh, DOE. Um, most of the research involved single investigator grants, so one professor with a couple of students working on something. Um, relatively low levels of industry support and um, engagement with the universities on hypersonics. Um, and as I'll show in a second, the, 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 the distribution of effort was heavily focused in one area um, on aerothermodynamics. Part of the good news that is that many of the top-ranked engineering schools in the country uh, were and are conducting hypersonics research. I'm here at Colorado, but you think of your favorite, you know, uh, tier one research school. They almost certainly are doing some amount of hypersonics research. 
Um, what was not so good at the time was that there were no uh, centers of excellence or you know whatever you would like to call it, no kind of clustered activity in hypersonics in the universities um, around 2017. Although there had been three different um, centers of excellence in hypersonics co-funded by the Air Force and NASA that had ended in uh, 2015. So this is the distribution of topics that U.S. Um, university authors were publishing in uh, for, again, for hypersonics. Um, and again, you can see, you know, there's this uh, predominance in one particular area, which is aerothermodynamics. It's actually one of the areas I uh, work in, but that's the, the high temperature flow that hypersonic uh, produces. So certainly aerothermodynamics um, is important. But this is really not, you know, a good distribution of effort um, across um, our universities. So, um, so what does all of this mean? So, so this is another very interesting uh, plot to look at. So again, this is the, the total number of journal articles being published on hypersonics as a function you're going back to 2005, and uh, the U.S. is in blue, and you can see that back in 2005, you know, the U.S. was actually was easily the number one country in the world for in terms of this particular metric. And what's happened to the U.S. numbers of publications? Again, from these are from universities. Um, you know, in the last 15 years, is you could say it's kind of inched up a little bit, right? But it's it's uh, it's not really increased very much. Uh, but that's in stark contrast to what's happened with China, where their growth in this particular metric is clearly kind of on an exponential scale. Um, I had wanted to look up the 2020 numbers. I didn't, I didn't get a chance to do it, but there's no sign of any of that changing um, yet. I think it will change in the near future. Now, there's lots of caveats in any particular metric, but, but that trend is pretty, pretty compelling. So partly as a result of seeing those kinds of trends, not just in journal publications, but total number of students. And, um, um, and then also just, of course, our own interest and development of hypersonics programs, uh, primarily in the DOD. Um, there have started to emerge some new approaches for the U.S. universities in hypersonics. Um, and a really good example of this is the University Consortium for Applied Hypersonics, UCA. Um, that is funded by OSD through the Joint Hypersonics Transition Office. Um, and that's putting in $17 million a year. Um, just started last December, so it's really just getting up and running. But that alone almost doubled university research funding uh, in hypersonics. Uh, UCA has managed out of the Texas A&M University. And UCA, uh, and just more generally, um, the the engagement with um, the hypersonics community um, is is changing in some ways. So it's increased in size through that, you know, through increased funding, but also looking at broader engagement. What I showed before, the emphasis on aerothermodynamics. Don't take the message away from that that we want to decrease the work in, in, in aerothermodynamics. We need to probably increase it a little bit, but we really need to increase the, uh, the research that we were doing in the other areas like GNC, materials propulsion and so on. Um, and as we sort of mature those different areas, we also need to start thinking more about interdisciplinary research, right? And that's where all of this background that I'm providing here feeds into the, the main topic for, for my talk today, which is this interdisciplinary um, research. Another thing that's changing for the universities is increased interaction with industry, um, part of, partly facilitated by UCA, but even just in my own experience, I have much more funded research with the aerospace primes today and hypersonics than I ever have before. Um, you know, why? Why, why is this uh, increased engagement occurring? You know, the universities have, certainly have very advanced modeling and simulation capabilities, but they're not software tools and, and, and they definitely need some help to be transitioned um, to, the, to the industry workplace. Uh, the universities have some unique test capabilities like quiet wind tunnels that can come from national assets. Um, and then, of course, you know, the way that we do research in universities is through uh, graduate students and, and postdocs. 
And so as we're advancing um, capabilities uh, for research, we're also training uh, the workforce and can help with things like getting students clearances before they uh, before they graduate. OK, so with all of that sort of background for 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 you know, non-technical reasons for thinking about interdisciplinary research. Uh, what about on the technical side? And so on this uh, slide here, there's a couple of examples of how and why interdisciplinary research is, is important in the field of hypersonics. And so the one on the left um, titled Ablating Vehicle, this is this picture is actually uh, from NASA, but you can think of it as being the nose of a hypersonic weapon for, for DOD applications. And so the black outline that you see on the left there is the, the thermal protection system, the, the thickness of material, the heat shield that is going to protect the hypersonic vehicle that would be to the right of the image. And then the image on, on the right hand side under ablating vehicle, you can see there's this gold band there. So that gold band is all the material that uh, it is predicted to be removed as a function, as a result of flying uh, this hypersonic vehicle along its trajectory, and so that material is removed through a process called ablation. And ablation is it's an interesting process where an oxygen atom um, from the high temperature air reaches the surface of the vehicle and it pulls a carbon atom off the surface, and 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 the carbon and the, and the oxygen get together as a an oxide molecule CO. So ablation occurs one atom at a time, um, but it is seen at the kind of mesoscale, right? You can actually see afterwards, you know, uh, how much material was ablated from your, your hypersonic vehicle. So, so what does this all mean? This means that you have in a hypersonic flow, high temperature gas, that high temperature gas ablates the vehicle surface, you're, as you're ablating the vehicle surface, you're changing the shape of the vehicle. You're changing the, you know, the term bolt line of the vehicle. Um, and so your drag coefficient is changing, your lift coefficient may be changing. So those aerodynamic parameters are, are what the guidance, navigation, and control algorithm needs to, to do the trajectory uh, handling. Um, and so all these things are interconnected. And, and, and they're all different disciplines. There's, there's, there's gas dynamics, there's, there's material science, uh, controls, and so today, what we generally do is 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 fight against um, all these different aspects that go into analyzing and designing a hypersonic vehicle. And for the future, what we really want to be able to do is optimize optimize a vehicle design, taking into account the fact that it's going to ablate along its trajectory, include all of that in the analysis to come up with um, you know the best vehicle that we can. Uh, design, given all the different things that, that happen to it. So that's one example. The, the, the second example on the right um, is for a powered hypersonic vehicle, a scramjet, right? it's, a, it's a hypersonic uh, propulsion system. And here the idea is, again, you've got a lot of heat in the gas around the vehicle. Um, some of that heat soaks into the structure of, of the vehicle. We, we often talk about the thermal soak of hypersonic and so now the structure of the vehicle is, is, is very hot. It's a little bit softer than it was when it was cold, and it can be subject to deformations. And so um, for a propulsion system, uh, one of the key aspects of combustion is, is, the, is the, you know, the pressure in the combustion chamber. And so for a scramjet system, if the, if the geometry of the inlet of the engine is changing then uh, if during flight, then that changes um, the shock structure of, of the airflow into the engine. That changes the pressure of the air. Ultimately, it changes the performance of the engine, uh, including the thrust. So again, you know, the, ideally what we'd like to be able to do is analyze all of these different aspects, the high temperature air, the deformations of the structure, um, the effects on the combustion, and uh, in order to optimize the vehicle trajectory and performance. So in order to be able to do interdisciplinary optimization research, there's two very specific things we need. One is that the predictive models of each of the subsystems, whether it's the, um, the, the aerothermodynamics or the combustion or the materials, those have to be you know, high fidelity and predictive models. And secondly, we need um, effective um, optimization approaches um, to, to give us the best result that accounts for all these uh, different uh, behavior. 
and and so um, that's what people are starting to do in the universities uh, uh, in in terms of research. I'm trying to. Uh, here we go. Good. Okay. So we're not unique in this, but at the the University of Colorado, and uh, for historical reasons, we call ourselves CU. Um, we've we've recognized this uh, challenge and opportunity, and we have an activity that's really like a, an IRAD in industry. It's an internally funded activity um, called the uh, HIVERT, the Hyper Vehicles Interdisciplinary Research Team. And so this is something that our College of Engineering uh, competes across many different areas every three years. And I led a proposal um, that was uh, funded uh, last year, last summer, um, with a focus on multi-physics optimization of hypersonic vehicles, right, for all the reasons that I've just talked about. Um, and so this involves uh, more than 20 faculty and about 30 grad students and postdocs. And the idea is here that we have uh, professors who are, are, you know, subject matter experts on materials or on GNC. And we have other faculty who know almost nothing about hypersonics, but they are experts in optimization. And so the purpose of Hyper is to bring these different uh, communities across our campus, well, across our college mostly, uh, together. Uh, to think about optimization of hypersonic vehicles. And one of the things we're doing with the internal funds is leveraging them against uh, external funds um, so that um, there's kind of a win-win for us and, and other people. And so we've been quite successful the first year with a number of projects, some of them funded by NASA and Lawrence Livermore, uh, Sandia, and others. And there's, uh, there's more information there at that website if you're interested. Well, let's uh, let, let's turn to some of the technical stuff um, to try and um, give you an understanding of some of the challenges here. So I'm going to I'm going to keep things relatively simple. You'll see that that uh, it's a relative term. Um, I want to think about the interdisciplinary uh, connections between the hypersonic flow and the material response. So if I want to understand how ablation occurs, this is what I you know, have to think about. So first of all, I have to think about the hypersonic gas flow. And on its own, it, it, it consists of a lot of complicated physical uh, phenomena, including strong shock waves and chemical reactions and, and turbulent boundary layers. Um, on the material, what we call the material response, you know, what does the material respond in terms of that high temperature environment? Um, you can have heat conducting into the vehicle. You can have heat radiating away from the surface. Uh, we can have ablation and so on. So again, a lot of uh, complex processes to think about there. And then the interface, uh, both physically and for simulation, is on the surface of the vehicle, between the gas and the material. And that's where, for example, ablation occurs. It's through uh, surface chemistry. And so again, a number of different processes to think about. So I'm gonna walk through um, how we and my research group these different areas and, and again these are not unique capabilities but it, it illustrates uh, what what needs to be done to analyze these systems so to model a hypersonic flow we use computational fluid dynamics cfd here we're solving three-dimensional navier stokes equations we have chemical reactions going on turbulence the algorithm is implicit so it runs efficiently on high performance computing um, we, we couple the CFD code to the material response as a boundary condition. Um, our code, Le Mans, has been verified against uh, government codes and validated using you know, various sets of, of experimental data. Uh, sorry. So um, a CFD code is great. How do you know it's any good? And, and so, so part of the work that we do is um, to develop from first principles, uh, very advanced computational chemistry models. This is a, a movie that, it, that I didn't think was a good idea to try uh, and, and run on so uh, live rather. So in any case, what computational chemistry involves is thinking about how individual molecules collide with other molecules one question at a time. Uh, to see if a chemical reaction occurs when an O2 molecule hits an N2 molecule uh, and other phenomena that, that can occur. And so we run literally billions of these calculations. Um, they build up 
into uh, what we call rates, rates chemical reactions that we can validate against experimental data. So that's sort of shown on the top right hand corner. Once we have the validated rates, we put those into our CFD code Le Mans and uh, try to use ground test data like from uh, wind tunnels and shock tunnels. So that's shown in the bottom left hand corner, the CFD validation. This is a double cone configuration run in a shock tunnel at Kubrick. Um, this is a case where we get agreement between the CFD and the measurements. That's certainly not always the case. But once we have developed some confidence in our CFD code, then we can go to the bottom right hand corner of the slide and start doing you know, analysis of full scale vehicles. And what I love about the slide is you go from the top left hand corner of individual molecules to the bottom right hand corner of you know, full vehicle scale simulations. And then once you can do full vehicle simulations, then you can do a lot of interesting stuff. And, and this is kind of a little smorgasbord of different things we've done. Um, you know, top left hand corner is the plasma around a hypersonic vehicle to help understand uh, communications blackout. Uh, top right hand corner is the plasma in the wake behind a hypersonic vehicle that might be useful for signatures. Um, I'll, uh, maybe I'll just uh, also talk uh, about the, the bottom right hand corner there for if you have a hypersonic sensing platform, um, how does the hypersonic flow affect different modes of uh, modalities of sensing? Here we were looking at the effects of turbulence on uh, EO sensing. Okay, so that's all of the, uh, the gas flow. We also have to think about what's going on on the surface. I won't talk about this in any great detail at all. But we use something called the finite rate surface chemistry module, FRSC. It allows us to model a lot of different uh, surface processes. The most important one probably is uh, what's called oxidation reduction here. That's actually the ablation uh, mechanism. But we use this to, so let's say we use this to model ablation in, in our simulation. And then the third part of the, the, the modeling uh, uh, system is the material response. Uh, we have this code called Mopar. Um, it's coupled directly to the CFD code Le Mans through that surface module. The picture I'm showing here is, is not for a hypersonic vehicle. It's for a rocket engine that, that has an ablating uh, liner to it. But it kind of illustrates how the, the flow and the material uh, meshes are, are kind of coupled together. OK, so let me just in the last few minutes show you a couple of uh, examples of interdisciplinary research uh, using these uh, these tools. So all of these results have been uh, generated with Le Mans and Mopar. And um, so the top left hand corner here is a, is a simulation of an arc jet test, uh, multi uh, component material. And we're simulating the external hypersonic flow and, and, and the flow of heat into the materials. Uh, the top right hand corner is an ablating case. Uh, it's hard to see some of the details, I, I, I admit, but the, this kind of right hand contours is showing you how the shape of the nose of a vehicle is, is ablating away as a function of time. Right? So imagine you're flying along your hypersonic trajectory, and this is showing you how the shape of the vehicle is changing as a function of time. Um, one of the areas that we're active in right now is in looking at ultra high temperature ceramics, UHTCs. These are a special class of material that can go can, uh, up to very high temperatures, 3000 degrees Kelvin. So here we're analyzing um, a, a component, a UHTC com, uh, composite rather, of hafnium diboride and silicon carbide that was tested at a, in an art jet test uh, at NASA Ames. And uh, yeah, so these are, these are examples of the flow and the surface chemistry and uh, the, the, the material response going on all at the same time. Uh, this uh, second example here is in vehicle shape optimization. So here we're using our CFD code Le Mans, and it is connected to an optimization library called DOT. And uh, we can choose from parameters to optimize on. So uh, most of these results that I'm showing you here are to minimize drag. And we're looking at a particular vehicle, representative vehicle, the IRV2. Um, and so you can see there's a collection of four uh, sort of color contour pictures there. And so the first one, TP1, that's the actual geometry of the nose tip of IRV2. And we're analyzing it there at what TP1 is trajectory point one, 
at an altitude of 66 kilometers. When we run our optimization techniques uh, with Le Mans at this TP1 flight condition, um, the optimizer comes up with the kind of funky looking geometry that you can see there uh, on, on the right. And when I first saw these results, I thought, well, this has kind of ended up being an academic exercise. We've got all these great codes, but the results that we're getting are, you know, are kind of weird. Um, but we took into the literature and, and we found that uh, in the 50s, people at NASA had explored these very kinds of shapes uh, for low, Mach, uh, low hypersonic Mach number vehicles with the specific goal of uh, reducing drag. And so they didn't have CFD and they didn't have optimization tools. They just had intuition. And they showed experimentally that, that this, uh, this kind of shape does work. Well, one of the things about optimizing is you have to figure out, you know, where along the trajectory you're going to optimize for. And so the TP5 and the TP10 are showing the shapes that the optimizer comes up with at, 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 at the condition of 40 kilometers altitude, at a 20 kilometers altitude. And you can see the shape. Uh, it's a little bit similar, right? But they're a little bit different when you optimize at different places. And what we what we concluded at the end from all of this is that optimizing around TP5 actually gives you the overall best performance for a trajectory. Well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly mention um, this uh, new project that we have that really relates to a lot of the interdisciplinary stuff that I've been uh, talking about today. It's a NASA project uh, called ACCESS. It's a NASA Space Technology Research Institute that, uh, that I'm leading here at, uh, at Colorado. It starts just in a few weeks' time. And it's a five-year, uh, $50 million investment from NASA. And the overall objective is to create a simulation capability to assess um, the reliability of hypersonic entry systems. And, and so what goes into that is all of the, the topics I've discussed already today, the, all of the flow processes like chemistry and turbulence, the material and structural response. But one of the things that's new and important here is um, this uncertainty quantification. So when I calculate a drag coefficient, compute a drag coefficient, you know, I don't know that with absolute certainty, right? There's some uh, plus or minus that needs to be applied to that. And the plus or minus, the uncertainty really feeds in direct to the quantification of reliability, whether it's for a hypersonic uh, heat shield for NASA or for DOD. And we've got the flow, we've got the material response, the uncertainty quantification, and we have to integrate all of that into one big uh, simulation framework. So it's going to be a challenging project, but there'll be a lot of over uh, or, or overlap yeah, with, with uh, interests uh, for DOD. And, and I'm sure that uh, we will be transitioning some of the, the results and tools that we develop in this project to DOD. Um, and um, so one of the, the final thing I talk about is workforce development. So that's certainly one of the ways in which um, the universities are becoming, of course, more actively engaged and can contribute to, to the missions of DOD and hypersonics. And, uh, and again, here at CU, we've uh, just this fall, this semester, introduced a graduate hypersonic certificate. Um, it's really a subset of a master's degree. You, you have to take four uh, graduate level courses to earn this certificate. Uh, there's one required course and, and three electives. Some of those are classroom based. Some of them are research projects. We're starting to uh, uh, develop a, a hypersonics design course. Um, these, uh, these classes and the certificate can be taken by non-degree participants uh, remotely. Uh, and so again, if you're interested in, in details, the, uh, the URL there provides more information. So I know uh, maybe I've uh, run over a little bit of time here, but uh, here's uh, the, the summary. Um, and uh, so hopefully I've shown to you how and why uh, the US is strengthening its high, uh, hypersonics community in the university. Um, also talked about the need for interdisciplinary research in hypersonics and how it involves optimization and the development of high fidelity um, analysis tools. And in the end, um, active development of interdisciplinary approaches will enhance the performance of hypersonic systems. So thanks for your uh, attention and um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Very good, thank you, Dr. Boyd. Yeah, we had a few questions come in uh, during the presentation. So uh, we can go ahead and jump to them, but just want to remind everybody that uh, there is that question portal button at the top of the screen if you're in the any meeting platform here, so you can submit them that way. 
So I'm going to go ahead here and should be able to share, put, put the questions up on the screen so everyone can see them. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just read that loud for those who are just dialed in and won't be able to see it. And then um, Dr. Boyd, you can go ahead and just respond from there. So the first question uh, says, if you're designing a vehicle for hypersonic flight at say another planet like Venus, then the chemical nature of the ablation process will be different in the materials chosen different question mark. Is that correct? Would be the uh, question. Yes, uh, that's, that's a great question. Absolutely uh, correct. Uh, the, the chemistry of the atmosphere of another planet uh, will almost certainly be different uh, from ours. So in that, um, in that NASA Institute that we're starting up, um, we're going to look at three different missions. The first one is to, um, uh, one of the moons of Saturn, uh, Titan, and its, um, its atmosphere is mainly nitrogen, but it has a little bit of methane. And it turns out that that little bit of carbon in that atmosphere can uh, react chemically to produce um, a molecule called CN, the, the cyanide uh, uh, radical, that creates a lot of radiation. So in that atmosphere, probably no ablation at all because there's no oxygen, um, but, but the effect of radiation is really, really important. So the bottom line is, yes, you have to think about both uh, the, the chemistry of the atmosphere you're flying in and, and how it interacts with the material in order to you know, design um, your, your heat shield for a specific case. Very good. Perfect. Thank you. All right. I'm seeing a bunch of questions. Uh filing in the queue. So that's great. So we'll have a, quite a few to go through. So let's jump to the next one. Next question is, do we have structural optimization methods that are not limited to quote static conditions of pressure, temperature, and flows at certain time? That is, can we optimize the structure for pressure, temperature, and flow that is changing every instant of time? Yeah, that's a great question. We have a couple of projects in my group right now sort of looking at that uh, that question and it comes down to looking at the time scales of all these different processes that are occurring what's the time scales of the hypersonic flow what's the time scales of the structural response uh, which is uh, Sue's question here what's the time scale of the material response and um, at least for the cases we're looking at it seems like the, the, the material time scales are, are relatively long the flow scales are really short and the structural lies somewhere in between so we, in our work, we will probably try to closely couple the flow and the structural response and, 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 and be a little bit uh, uh, more relaxed, literally, with, with how the material uh, responds. But this is a great, a great question because it illustrates uh, kind of the complexity, also this kind of um, intellectual challenges that lie behind all of, uh, all of this work. Exactly. All right, great. Uh, next question, uh, just kind of more generally, is the U.S. research community using Chinese publications? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, I think that um, you know, it's interesting. I mean, you you can you can ask yourself why is China publishing so many papers? I you know, I think I sometimes look at some of their papers and and say to myself, we you know, in the U.S., we would not publish those papers probably on those particular details. So I think there's a little bit of they're, you know, they're trying to show um, uh, the progress they've made, um, both technically, but also almost politically. Um, but, you know, one of the other things that's changed about the Chinese publications, I would say 10 years ago, most of their papers, you know, they're, they're trying to catch up on the work that other people have done. Um, but, to, but today, the, you know, they're, they're publishing you know, new ideas, new algorithms, new information. Uh, so that we would be foolish not to be looking at their uh, papers. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's lots of political <laughs> nuances to that, to answering this question in full. All right, thank you. Uh, next question just simply asks if this recording, the presentation will be recorded and the answer is uh, yes, and, and we'll send out information about that uh, probably tomorrow. All right, next question. Uh, are Russian advancements in hypersonics less of a concern than those of China? Well, that's a, that's a there's a lot of depth to answering that question, and you know, and it uh, also comes back to uh, concern in what respect. Um, so I think I'm going to leave that question for another environment. <laughs> Very good, thank you. 
All right, the next question asks, how does the hypersonics academic community interact with the DoD to inform policy and funding priorities? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you, you know, myself, personally, I have a, a, a very deep interest in that, in that uh, and I've been doing it myself for, for a number of years. Um, that can be facilitated through things like uh, advisory boards. I think the, uh, the university consortium is also an avenue to, to help foster these discussions. Um, over the last few years, uh, OSD has been formulating um, a classification guide for hypersonics uh, across DOD, and, uh, and and there was some participation in that from the universities. So I, you know, I, I hope those channels uh, continue to remain open and, and, and maybe even expanded because uh, if, uh, you know, the universities do have uh, an important role to play here, and it's important that, um, uh, you know, things are configured in a way that is optimal uh, for, for all the people involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, I'm sure there's a number of different pla uh, places that there's intersection between uh, the academic community and the DOD. So uh, and that's another area that, from our perspective, DSI, we'd be happy to help facilitate that, those connections. Um, Again, coming from a DOD organization here. All right, uh, next question. Uh, have you considered, or perhaps more generally, the hypersonic community considered manufacturing capability when looking at shape optimization? Yeah, that's a great question, too. And that's, you know, that's the kind of question that people are, of course, now starting to, uh, to really ask. It's, um, you know, you, you may well give up uh, some performance from a material or a shape, um, if it's uh, if it's easier to manufacture, if it's cheaper to manufacture, um, and and so the optimization of a hypersonic system, um, you know, has to account for uh, many more things when you're starting to think about programs of record and and having capability in the field. It's it's not just enough to be maximizing um, your your range, right, or minimizing your drag. You've got to think through all the uh, all the, uh, uh, the utilities, the illities that go into manufacturing, uh, including sustain, you know, sustainability, um, but also manufacturability. So it's a great question. People are starting to think about it, but I would say it's still pretty early days. Okay, thank you. All right, next question. What is the preferred aerodynamic prediction method for hypersonic stability and control? Well, I'm not a, a controls expert per se. You know, in, in the end, um, you know, you, you rely on uh, accurate uh, estimates of the key aerodynamic coefficients, the, the lift and drag and the turning moments. And while there are a lot of um, extra processes going on in a hypersonic vehicle that don't apply to a subsonic vehicle, at the end of the day, from the, the guidance, navigation, and control uh, aspect, I mean, things happen a little bit faster, of course, in hypersonics, but but traditional methods um, are, are are typically relatively successful for hypersonics too. Okay, good. Uh, next question starts off saying that the background knowledge, model, modeling expertise at CU, would, is very impressive. Uh, so the question now back to manufacturing again is: Do you also have expertise in manufacturing technologies, and if not? Maybe you, are you open to considering inter-university inter collaborations? Well, I'm not going to say no to that, right? So, so, <laughs> um, uh, so, so manufacturing, well, we have some capability here at CU, but it's not uh, as strong as some of our other areas. And we're certainly always interested in, uh, you know, partnering with, uh, uh, with, with, with other organizations uh, to, you know, to, to bring a, a more complete uh, solution to, to a problem. So, so yeah, I mean, part of the uh, reason from my side to, to take advantage of this opportunity today is, uh, is to open doors uh, for further discussions. Yeah. Well, and to that end, I believe your uh, email is on the slides, correct? Or contact information, perhaps some way to yeah. get in touch with you. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, there's a question about, availability of the slides again they should be on the website webinars web page if uh, at the very least we will send out a follow-up email with information about the recording and also include the link for the slide so uh, that can be available as well 
All right. Uh, the next question is asking, um, says, hey, from a background of numerical methods like computational science, uh, do you know of any short course program in hypersonics to help get up to speed, uh, bone up a bit on numerical methods in that field? Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't, there's not a go-to answer that I'm aware of. Um, the, the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics often uh, holds, um, you know, uh, workshops that maybe go over uh, a few days. And, and I have seen at least one in this uh, particular area, hypersonic CFD. Um, and so I think if you try to web search on that kind of thing, I think you might find some. So it's kind of like a professional course. Um, and again, part of what the university consortium is interested in doing is, is, is this kind of thing. I don't know if they've gotten uh, something like this in place yet, but, um, but yeah, I, I, Alberto, I hope, I hope you can find something online. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure there's some short courses out there. All right. Uh, next question asks: uh, Do the UCAH and AC and Access grants stipulate information that uh, is export controlled? Uh, would that limit participation just to U.S. citizens? Then, yeah, it's a good question because obviously there is a there is a plenty of sensitivity even without getting into the classified realm with these things. Mm -hmm. So um, I think for UCA right now. Um, you, you have to be a, a U.S. citizen, although there are um, a, a small number of international schools involved in the consortium, like in the U.K. and Australia and so on. And then access on the NASA, NASA side, there may be some of the work on materials that is um, is ITAR kind of thing, CUI. Mm -hmm. um, well, parts of it may be limited, but in general, it's, it's not uh, limited. Hmm. Okay. All right. Next question um, is just maybe from your perspective, your opinion, would an interdisciplinary research certificate program, in, a diff in addition to a hypersonic certificate, would that be of interest, maybe interest to the, the this kind of consortium um, community for hypersonics? Yeah, but potentially. I mean, I think that, um, you know, in general, the interdisciplinary uh, nature is maybe studied in sort of systems engineering, and, and there probably are certificates for that kind of thing. Um, specifically for hypersonics, you know, it, it's a growing community, um, but it but it's really been growing rapidly, and so we don't have. I don't think we're quite ready to do that yet. I mm -hmm. think that you need to be a little bit further along so that you could really use them in the classroom or, you know, use, use them across a number of courses. So I think that could be coming if hypersonics is here to stay. Um, I think we're not quite ready to do it yet. So your recommendation would be more uh, stick to kind of particular specialty areas? Well, I think we're going to see a lot of research in into this, right. right? So a certificate program is usually more about, um, you know, um, there's a certain amount of classroom material, coursework. And yes, yeah. maybe a little bit of research. At least that's how we do it here. And I think we don't have the classwork figured out just yet. Ah, I see. Okay. All right. Uh, next question is asking if your work includes glide vehicles as well. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I didn't talk about them per se, but uh, probably mo mostly on glide vehicles, actually. All right. Very good. All right, the next question is asking if uh, CU has done any work in uh, Lattice Boltzmann simulation versus NS. And I apologize, I'm not sure if NS, what NS is, but perhaps you know. Right, so that would be the, the Navier-Stokes equations, which is what mm -hmm. we use in our uh, CFD. So, so, so we haven't, and, um, um, you know, uh, so I guess that I haven't seen a lot of comparisons in the hypersonics domain for Lattice Boltzmann versus uh, Navier-Stokes. Hmm. Okay, good question. All right, next question asks if your materials research focused more on understanding current materials or finding better materials for hypersonic applications? Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. So certainly a little bit of both. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think um, people have flown uh, hypersonic vehicles with heat shields and they worked. 
Um, but the question is, you know, how much uh, additional performance uh, was left behind because you made the heat shield extra thick, for example. And, and so that's part of understanding current materials. Uh, but then you'd like to be able to, you always want to be able to fly faster. And so, um, you know, uh, today's materials allow us to go at whatever, Mach, make it up Mach 15. So how do we get to Mach 20? Uh, what, what, what do we need from the materials to be able to do that? So it's a little bit of both. Mm, good point. All right, and then more uh, generally about hypersonics. So what are the speeds that are considered hypersonic? And uh, maybe what do you envision in terms of that speeds, those speeds going forward? Well, it's a it's kind of a, a, a rough um, uh, definition as opposed to a, a strict one. But people usually say if you're going at Mach 5 uh, and above, um, then that's uh, what we call hypersonic. And... Um, uh, but you know one of the one of the challenges and, and complexities of hypersonics is um, that, that that different missions are going at different hypersonic speeds. So Mach five is maybe a scramjet powered uh, system, cruise system. Um, you know the the processes that you have to think about at Mach five are very different from a reentry vehicle that's coming in at Mach twenty five. Um, and so hy hypersonics really is more than one thing. It, it's really a continuum of uh, of, uh, of physical processes that become important and then fade away but then something else comes in and and, and takes over as being important and so um so i like that I, I like the question from that that perspective <laughs> that's good okay next question asks uh so is the cu team research are the cu team and researchers are they focused mainly on the modeling and designing well, what about propulsion and other systems? No, we're definitely uh, working in other areas, and and certainly materials is one where we you know have people who design materials, and we have test facilities here. Um, in propulsion, uh, we are doing uh, analysis and modeling of of scramjets and the combustion processes. Uh, also, developing uh, advanced uh, diagnostics uh, that could even be used in flight. To, to help uh, uh, sort of control uh, scramjet operations. So we have a, a, a variety of range of, uh, of interest. Very good. All right, um, next question starts off referencing say, an article that uh, for recently an article from China highlighted uh, four body energy deposition from laser for the purpose of drag reduction and all that comes from that. So then following that it says, is the U.S. Academy, industry, government kind of community also researching researching this? Uh, is perhaps that research uh, being driven by the Chinese, is the U.S. research being driven by the, the Chinese work on that, at least that you know of? Yeah, I mean, I think people have been looking at uh, energy deposition from, from lasers and electron beams and other sources uh, for decades. And some of it has been done. In the U.S., some of it in the you know Soviet Union and Russia, it's not, it's some of it now in China and around the world. So I think there are some of these these topics where you know it it, it really is a, um, a community uh, around the world where there's not necessarily collaboration across the community, but but people are building on each other's work. So I I, I think at this point it's pretty there's there's not a lot of uh, value in trying to figure out where it started. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly these kinds of ideas are also being uh, studied in the U.S. Oh, good, good. All right, and then more specifically, a question for your group. Is, is your group working directly with the EO sensing community, which I suspect is electro-optical, but maybe earth op observation? Not sure if you might be able to determine. Yeah, no, that's right. It's electro-optical. Um, yeah, okay. so you know, very limited capacity, and actually, we'd really like to get uh, you know a more direct uh, dialogue. Um, it's again, it's one of those uh, areas that are sensitive. Um, but for us to understand from the modeling perspective, what what's the key things that we need to understand uh, that affect um, the the EO uh, sensing uh, mission uh, would be very very valuable. So we're certainly uh, interested in that. Good. Yeah, I guess, uh, again, another reason why you're you're here <laughs> trying right. to promote the work, create collaboration. Very good. Uh, next question, actually, one after it are somewhat similar. So I'll just ask the one and tag on the second here really quick. 
So this question says, how can private companies and uh, partner with universities to do interdisciplinary research? And the following question asks uh, what the consortium and the kind of the academic community would need from, in general, from industry. So kind of what is, how can this academic community uh, work with industry and what do they need from industry? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I, I can't really speak for the consortium. I mean, we are members of it, but um, uh, so, but what I will say is the consortium, uh, I think, has a mechanism by which industry can um, provide information to uh, that that can inform uh, future RFPs uh, that will be, you know, for which the universities can uh, submit proposals. So there is a mechanism by which, if you have an idea, you're sitting in industry, you have a problem, and you think universities might be able to help. Um, you know, you can go through UCA to uh, potentially, right? I mean, I mean, all the companies are doing this, so there's a down select process, I'm sure, there too. But there, there is a pathway there, um, and I think that's a very important function for the consortium. Um, you know, we, uh, we, we, we have a lot of um, close interaction here. I'm going to say with with uh, Lockheed. Um, they have a, have a prominent facility not far from the, the Boulder campus. And in the end, you know, it really takes um, it, it, its uh, uh, value in is uh, is value out. So I think it takes commitment of a certain amount of time to sit down uh, and 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 share at some level, you know, the nature of the problems or or the things that industry is interested in with uh, with potential university partners uh, to have a dialogue to really understand if the universities have things that. That can benefit industry. So I think it's it's like everything, right? You have to uh, be willing to, on both sides, um, invest a little bit of time to see if there's something there, um, and and that's worked well with with our interactions with with Lockheed and and others. Uh, but but looking back on it, that's what it takes. Hmm. It, just to jump off that, do you know of any um, well, off the top of your head any ongoing? Um, I'll say events, um, opportunities for folks to get together kind of in a working group setting to, to have these more organic discussions? Well, there are a lot of, I mean, there are a number of hypersonics conferences, symposia, events, um, right. you know, throughout the, throughout the year. And of course, you know, a lot of them have ended up being virtual over the last 18 months because of COVID, but there, but there certainly are opportunities and, you know, very hopeful, of course, that um, even next year, right, uh, many of the events will start to become in person. But those are really great networking opportunities. Uh, you know, there's probably about 10 of them a year. I mean, there's really a lot of opportunities out there. So I encourage um, people interested in, 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 in those kinds of networking opportunities to, again, to, to search on the web. These are, these are you know, widely uh, advertised events. Yeah, agreed. And, and for what it's worth, we try to uh, monitor them and make sure that we advertise them out to the community to help encourage those opportunities as well. All right, uh, the last question we have in queue is, uh, have new high-speed sensors for determining roll and angular positioning of a hypersonic vehicle with reference to an, another object during flight? Current GNC sensors may not be sufficiently fast or have or may have latencies in measurement of position and roll. Are new sensor technologies being considered? Well, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I can imagine, you know, if you're uh, on the defensive side of hypersonics, if you're trying to if you're trying to uh, kill one hypersonic vehicle with another hypersonic vehicle, then there is a lot of dynamic behavior uh, when you know in the end game there. Um, and so, I would imagine again, this isn't my specific area, but I would imagine. Um, People like the Missile Defense Agency are thinking about these kinds of questions. Yep. Very good. And, and um, I'll just, again, quick plug for our organization. One of the services we offer is a uh, technical inquiry research service. So if there's questions like this that we, we can help do some research on, do a little legwork on to find out what's out there, who's doing work in that area, we'd be happy to, to help answer that. So I uh, encourage everyone to go to our website, take advantage of that service. Well, um, after that shameless plug, I'm actually, unfortunately, we we're at the end of the questions, but we we're at the top of the hour here. So, um, hey, I appreciate your time, Dr. Boyd. I appreciate the presentation. Very well delivered. 
Um, great stuff. And I appreciate all the conversation and questions we had at the end here. So um, without further ado, or, or without any more kind of uh, discussion here, I, I, I'll just kind of close it out saying thank you to your time and thank you for everybody attending. Well, thanks again, Brian, for the opportunity. It was great. Great. Absolutely. Have a great day.